still doesn't say it's on. Sunday School, those of you who are here in person and those of you who are joining us via our live stream. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, the title of the message is, let me read it, uh, Fires, Lions, Giants, and Storms, Oh My. I'm glad you laughed. I appreciate that very much. Um, so, and as you can see, we're going through a little trial right now. I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to um, look at what's going on actually in, in my life and uh, not really speak into this little technology thing that's going on right now, but uh, specifically to um, something that's going on in, in my life. I'm going through a little bit of a, a rough time. And um, so... I got the inspiration for this uh, message from that. Um, and uh, I've been wondering for some time, there is a um, section of Scripture, and it's 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And I've been greatly intrigued by that verse for uh, many, many years. Um, and really, what had struck me early on is the fact that, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is speaking uh, about the definition of love. And he's speaking to what love is and what love is not. And then all of a sudden, right when that's done, he says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And I often wondered about, okay, the greatest of these is love. What what, what does that mean? But I think especially the inspiration that Pastor Mark has had over the last several years, and we've been talking about love and, and love and, and love, loving God and loving each other. You know, that has become very apparent to me that the greatest of these is love. But what struck me this time is the word remain. H have you ever wondered about that? And he's talking about what love is and what love is not. And all of a sudden he says, yet these three remain. Remain. Well, you know, remain means what's left, right? What, what's still there when something happens. So I said, all right, I'm going to look this up. And basically, it does mean that. Uh, it comes from the Greek word uh, meno, and it means to be part, to be a part not destroyed, taken, or used up. To be something yet to be shown, done, or retreated. Or treated. Uh, second is to stay in the same place or with the same person or group, especially to stay behind, to remain, to continue unchanged. So I thought, wasn't well, that interesting? Um, I'm lying in my bed and I see this vision of the fiery furnace and being in the fire and I'm thinking, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going through a fiery furnace right now myself. And I started thinking, well, what else is there that's similar, similar to that? And I'm like, oh, Daniel and the lions then? Oh, David and Goliath? Oh, Peter getting out of the boat during the rainstorm. And I said, boy, I'm going to, I'd like to take a look at these. Well, when you consider... Each one of these can be considered a tribulation. So I want to go through each one of these. Now, it doesn't specifically say any of these is a tribulation, and I'm using that word, tribulation, but it's a trial. It's a difficult time. Specifically, I want to point out sorrow, trouble, affliction, adversity, sickness, oppression, 
misfortune. Any of these can be described as tribulation. I like to think that there's three types of people. Those who are going through a trial, those who have been through a trial, and those who are going to go through a trial. It's going to happen. It's, it's guaranteed. So I want to talk a little bit about the differences between these four scenarios. I would put out there, look at the book of Job, and the book of Job has each one of these uh, in it, if not more. All right, so with that, let's go uh, and talk about the fiery furnace. I am not going to read out of the selection of Scripture, but I will let you know where to find it, so you want to look it up. It's Daniel three sixteen to 28. And just in the way of background, we all know the story. Um, I'm going to try to subdue my urge to throw out a bunch of uh, little um, uh, peculiarities that, that, that come to mind, Seinfeldisms as it relates to the Word of God. But I can't help myself, and I'm on a time constraint. But isn't it interesting, Daniel is spoken to about his Hebrew name, Daniel. Yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are noted by their Babylonian names. You ever wonder why that is? It's a little peculiarity, don't you think? And right after this incident we're talking about, you don't hear from them anymore. Wonder why. I, again, I have no answers to these things. I'm just throwing them out. Uh, so this is a situation where the ruling government, a little bit of background, okay, Nebuchadnezzar's the king. So Babylon is a monarchy, okay? So there's the king and his family rules, and that's pretty much it. Now, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come from Israel. They've been taken over, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes three different uh, instances where he brings in folks from Israel into Babylon. And he's trying to tear down the culture of Israel. And Israel is a theocracy, meaning that it's, it's a nation that's, that's ruled by religion, and in this case, by God. Okay? So he is trying to actively tear down this culture, okay, and, and get rid of their belief systems. All right? So... One way, one way he's going to do that now is to create this big statue that they have to worship. All right? Now, ironically, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did so well in their training that he promotes them into the government. All right? So they have responsibility ruling over different regions. So they're part of the governing authority of the land. So Nebuchadnezzar says, all right, everybody, you're going to have to worship this statue. Well, that flies right into the face of what their faith system is. Now, here's the application, all right? What I'm trying to impart to everyone is how faith, hope, and love is a key part of everyone's trials. So... In doing so, let's look at the key verse that's here, which is verse 17. This is the the voice of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they say, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. If that's not faith, I don't know what is. So right there, they are proclaiming their faith, and they are exercising their faith. They are not going to be swayed, and they're going to stand by their God. The second thing that happens is, and what you're going to see oftentimes is faith and hope are connected. Right there is hope. The God we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us, deliver us from your majesty's hand. They have hope in being saved from this situation. They get thrown into the fire. 
doesn't sound like they got saved from the situation. They got put in the fire. Yet, they did not, they did not die. And Nebuchadnezzar sees a fourth person in the fire with them. And many theologians believe that fourth person is the pre-incarnate, meaning the pre-before Christ took on a human form. It was Jesus in there with them. Now, doesn't that speak volumes to us? When we're going through a fire in our lives, Jesus is right there with us. Now, what was it that motivated them to have the faith and the hope? It was their love of God. That was what manifested Jesus in that fire with them. Clearly, they loved God. But the other thing that I think is of note, they all three stayed together. They loved each other. It wasn't all of a sudden that Meshach said, hey, I'm out of here. I'm not going through this fire. Hold on here. You two, you go in. I'm staying out. They all three went in together willfully. They had a unity out of love with each other. So right there in this instance is faith, hope, and love. All right? Next one. The lion's den. This is in Daniel 6, and it's verses 1 to 24. So. Let's give some background on this situation. So this is obviously many years after the fiery furnace instance. And now Nebuchadnezzar and his successor, his son, are defeated. And the Persians take over Babylon. So now Darius is the king. And so he has set up a government where there's a bunch of regional leaders. Okay? So again, he's King Darius, so we still have a monarchy situation, but we have governmental folks that are um, here. Now, I'm going to point to a specific uh, verse uh, later on. Uh, verse 3 is, is of note, all right? But this is a situation where co-workers, colleagues, maybe friends, of Daniel thought, hey, this guy, we don't like this guy. So we know that every day, three times a day, he goes up to his room, throws open his window, and prays toward Jerusalem. Again, a situation where the faith of the Hebrew people comes under attack. So knowing that, that this is going to happen, they create a scheme of man, an evil plot. So they come up with a decree, and they put it before the king, and they say, hey, look, you know, um, we've got a situation here where these people, they're you know, practicing their faith. This could be a threat against you. So perhaps what... But what you ought to do, King, is outlaw this practice. And, you know, in fact, anybody who does it, you ought to make, make it so that they get thrown into a lion's den. King says, yeah, okay, that sounds reasonable. He signs it into law. Well, in this case, whatever the king signs into law cannot be undone. It's permanently binding. It's not like the king can say, oh, I think I've changed my mind. I will create a different law. No, nope, it's not the case. So, their trap is sprung. They've got him. Daniel exercises his faith. Okay? And he goes to his room. He throws open the window. He prays. And can you imagine here they all are outside his door, throw open their door. Ha ha! We got you. Ha, ha, ha. So he gets taken and he gets thrown into the lion's den. Now, Darius is really mad. Really, really mad. Because he sees that he's been 
he's been fooled by his supposed leaders. All right, so I want you to look at verse 3. Verse 3 specifically says, The king planned to set Daniel over the whole kingdom. That's the reason. They were jealous. So you've got a situation where co-workers, colleagues, friends, out of jealousy decide they're going to do something. And so this puts Daniel in this situation where now he's in a lion's den. I want you to look at verse 16. That's our key verse. What I think is interesting is this. It is King Darius who says to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Now, it's interesting that a heathen king is applying faith to a situation and hope that he will come out of this terrible situation. King Darius. Now why? In verse 3, he had a relationship with Daniel. In fact, you could even infer he loved Daniel. Look at how he toiled all night. He couldn't sleep. If you really don't care about somebody, you know, you're going to go to bed, you're going to go to sleep. Oh, well, he clearly loved Daniel. And Daniel must have loved him as well. So here is an application of faith and hope and love that's entirely different. Daniel clearly loves God. Daniel clearly loves Darius, and Darius loves Daniel. So, we all know what happens. The next morning, I always visualize Darius, like, springing out of bed and, you know, uh, just sprinting to where that, that uh, lion's den is. Now, can you imagine all the, you know, the hoity-toity, you know, nobles that set the trap standing around, hey, king <laughs> and they throw open that uh i always envision it being a lid and it's underground and they look down and he yells daniel was your god able to save you and daniel yells up yes my king my god has saved me and how overjoyed both of them were at that particular moment and then he throws all the nobles <laughs> into the lion's den. And before they hit the ground, they're being devoured. So, in this situation, we see the application of faith, hope, and love to a positive outcome. Faith, hope, and love move God to action. Doesn't say how those lions decided they weren't going to have a tasty morsel named Daniel. All right, let's move to the next one, David and Goliath. That's in 1 Samuel 17. It's pretty much the entire chapter, but I've noted uh, verses 4 to 54. Now, we all know the story. There's a war between Israel and the Philistines, the the king of Israel is Saul, and uh, David is really, if you think about it, I've never thought about this before, he had already been anointed by uh, Samuel to be the king, so he's literally the king in waiting. So, his dad sends him from being the shepherd over the sheep. And says, I want you to check on your brothers who are in the army. See what's going on. He arrives on the scene. And the Philistines are on one hill. The Israelites are on another hill. And there's Goliath in in the valley. 
giant. What's interesting about this story is I'm a firm believer that you don't get external victories until you have internal ones. And in this case, that giant represents anything that we need to overcome in our lives. That situation, and we have it within our own lives. God knows who we are. And we have giants that we need to slay within our own lives. So that then, once those giants are slayed within us, we can slay giants outside in the world. Those giants are unique to us. Uh, Melissa talked about how David couldn't use Saul's armor because he hadn't used it before. He hadn't proven it. It wasn't fitted for him. It wasn't right for him. Plus, that's a scheme of man. You don't have to rely on God when you're putting on somebody else's armor. The situation was unique to the circumstance, to unique to the situation of Israel at the time, unique to the situation of David. And all of us, in one way, shape, or form, can be considered a misfit, can be considered an underdog. And those are the situations that require us to rely on God. We can turn to a scheme of man, we can turn to our own way, but we will not have success. The key verse here is in 32, where David says to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. That is a statement of faith. And he knew, because he had experience as a shepherd, when caring for the flock, if you're going to take on a lion or a bear, you better love that flock. If he didn't care about the sheep, go ahead, lion, go ahead, bear. Have a little tasty morsel on that sheep over there. I'm not going to be put in danger. He loved those sheep. So his love of God, because he had experience, he had already defeated the lion, he's already defeated the bear. He said, well, God did that before. It's interesting, when you exercise your faith and you gain experience, your hope greatly expands. Well, I can take on this giant. And so he does. And we know that he takes five smooth stones and a reminder, five is the number that symbolizes grace. So he's moving in God's grace, and he defeats the giant. The last one is the storm. Peter in the boat. Pastor Mark has talked a lot about this, so I'm not going to belabor. We know the story. That's in Matthew 14, 22 to 32. All four Gospels mention Jesus walking on the water. Only Matthew. Only Matthew's gospel says that Peter walked on the water. Now, as I meditated on this, what, what was the cause of this? Why was there this storm? Does anybody remember what happened just before? Jesus feeds the 5,000. So Jesus, with the apostles, does this miracle of feeding 5,000. They get in a boat, they leave, storm hits. 
Oftentimes, trials come to us following a personal victory. So that's not a surprise. The key verse here is verse 29, where Jesus says to Peter, Peter says to to Jesus just before this, he says, if that's you, Jesus, bid me to come. Verse 29, Jesus says, come. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Now, Peter started to fail. He started to sink when he took his eyes off Jesus and started looking at the wind and the waves. Something we can learn. All right? If your faith is locked on Jesus Christ, if your hope is locked on Jesus Christ, If you love Jesus Christ with all your might, you'll walk on water. He'll bring you through that storm. He'll empower you to get out of your safety and do something miraculous for Him. So as I wrap this up, Speaking of Peter, we know how much Peter loved Jesus, and we know how much Jesus loved Peter. And eventually, Peter went on to demonstrate his love for Jesus by loving others to the point where he too was killed for Jesus Christ, even after denying him three times. This is what Peter wrote in his letter. In, verses, or in chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name, for it is It is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And in verse 18, he quotes Proverbs 11.31. If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? In verse 19, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. We are allowed to suffer sickness, oppression, misfortune as a test of our faith, hope, and love. Will they remain? They will remain so long as we turn to the cross of Jesus. Here is a quote from the devotional, The Word for Every Day. It is God who provides comfort in sorrow, joy in trouble, peace in affliction, and happiness in adversity. It is God who gives songs in the dark of the night, and it is God who gives direction to the weary traveler on life's journey. Regardless of the weight of the burdens, we can find in God and in His grace enough to fill us with joy and consolation and enable us to rejoice in tribulation. Faith must be grounded in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Hope springs forth from that victory in Jesus Christ. And love comes from Jesus Christ who first loved us and gave us and gave his life for us on the cross so that we can share that love with others.
but the greatest of these is love. Thank you, and God bless. Yes.